Book Six, Chapter One. When Cubic got outside the front door, the hangers-on had already vanished. The street was empty. He felt in a dumb, bitter, and uncomprehending way, like a man who has destroyed his home without having prepared another. The mist was coming up from the sea, and he hadn't got his coat. He was as angry as a child. He wouldn't go back for it. It would be like admitting he was wrong. The only thing to be done now was to drink a strong whiskey at the Crown. At the saloon bar, they made way for him with respect. In the mirror marked Booth's gin, he could see his own reflection. The short flaming hair, the blunt and open face, broad shoulders. He stared like Narcissus into his pool and felt better. He wasn't the sort of man to take things lying down. He was valuable. Have a whiskey? somebody said. It was the green grocer's assistant from the corner shop. Cubitt laid a heavy paw across his shoulder, accepting, patronizing. The man who had done a thing or two in his time, chummy with the pale, ignorant fellow who dreamed from his commercial distance of a man's life. The relationship pleased Cubitt. He had two more whiskies at the grocer's expense. Got a tip, Mr. Cubitt? I've got other things to think of besides tips, Cubitt said darkly adding a splash. We were having an argument in here about Gay Perot for the 2.30, seemed to me. Gay Perot? The name didn't mean a thing to Cubitt. The drink warmed him. The mist was in his brain. He leant forward towards the mirror and saw Booth's gin. Booth's gin hallowed above his head. He was involved in high politics. Men had been killed. Poor old Spicer. Allegiances shifted like heavy balances in his brain. He felt as important as a prime minister making treaties. There'll be more killing before we're through, he mysteriously pronounced. He had his wits about him. He wasn't giving anything away, but there was no harm in letting these poor, sodden creatures a little way into the secrets of living. He pushed his glass forward and said, A drink all round. But when he looked to either side, they'd gone. A face took a backward look through the pane of the saloon door. Vanished. They couldn't stand the company of a man. Never mind, he said. Never mind and drank down his whiskey and left. The next thing, of course, was to see Colioni. He'd say to him, Here I am, Mr. Colioni. I'm through with Kite's mob. I won't work under a boy like that. Give me a man's job and I'll do it. The mist got at his bones. He shivered involuntarily. A gray goose. He thought if only Dallow, too, and Suddenly, loneliness took away his confidence. All the heat of the drink seeped out of him, and the mist, like seven devils, went in. Suppose Colioni simply wasn't interested. He came down onto the front and saw through the thin fog the highlights of the cosmopolitan. It was cocktail time. Cubitt sat down, chilled in a glass shelter, and stared out towards the sea. The tide was low, and the mist hit it. It was just a sliding and sibilation. He lit a cigarette, the match warm for a moment, the cupped hands. He offered the packet to an elderly gentleman wrapped in a heavy overcoat who shared the shelter. I don't smoke, the old gentleman said sharply, and began to cough, a steady hack, hack, hack towards the invisible sea. A cold night, Cubitt said. The old gentleman swiveled his eyes on him, like opera glasses, and went on coughing. Hack, 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 the vocal cords dry as straw. Somewhere out at sea, a violin began to play. It was like a sea beast mourning and stretching towards the shore. Cubitt thought of Spicer, who'd liked a good tune. Poor old Spicer.
The mist blew in, heavy, compact drifts of it like ectoplasm. Cubit had been to a seance once in Brighton. He had wanted to get in touch with his mother, dead twenty years ago. It had come over him quite suddenly. The old girl might have a word for him. She had. She was on the seventh plane where all was very beautiful. Her voice had sounded a little boozed. But that wasn't really unnatural. The boys had laughed at him about it, particularly old Spicer. Well, Spicer wouldn't laugh now. He could be summoned himself any time to ring a bell and shake a tambourine. It was a lucky thing he liked music. Cubic got up and strolled to the turnpike of the West Pier, which straddled into the midst and vanished towards the violin. He walked up towards the concert hall, passing nobody. It wasn't a night for courting couples to sit out. Whatever people there were upon the pier were gathered, everyone inside the concert hall. Cubit turned round it on the outside, looking in, a man in evening dress fiddling to a few rows of people in overcoats. I landed fifty yards out to the sea in the middle of the midst. Somewhere in the channel a boat blew its siren and another answered, and another like dogs at night, waking each other. Go to Colioni, he, and say. It was all quite easy. The old man ought to be grateful. Cubit looked back towards the shore and saw above the mists the high lights of the cosmopolitan, and they daunted him. He wasn't used to that sort of company. He went down the iron companionway to the gents and drained the whiskey out of him into the movement under the piles and came up onto the deck lonelier than ever. He took a penny out of his pocket and slipped it into an automatic machine. A robot face behind which an electric bulb revolved, iron hands for cubit to grip. A little blue card shot out at him. Your character delineated, Cubit read. You are mainly influenced by your surroundings and inclined to be capricious and changeful. Your affections are more intense than enduring. You have a free, easy, and genial nature. You make the best of whatever you undertake. A share of the good things of life can always be yours. Your lack of initiative is counterbalanced by your good common sense, and you will succeed where others fail. He dragged slowly on past the automatic machines, delaying the moment when there would be nothing for him to do but go to the cosmopolitan. Your lack of initiative... Two leaden football teams waited behind glass for a penny to release them. An old witch, with the stuffing coming out of her claw, offered to tell his fortune. A love letter made him pause. The boards were damp with mist. The long deck was empty, the violin ground on. He felt the need of a deep sentimental affection, orange blossoms, and a cuddle in a corner. His great paw yearned for a sticky hand, somebody who wouldn't mind his jokes, who would laugh with him at the two-valve receiving set. He hadn't meant any harm. The cold reached his stomach, and a little stale whiskey returned into his throat. He almost felt inclined to go back to Frank's, but then he remembered Spicer. The boy was mad, killing mad. It wasn't safe. Loneliness dragged him down the solidary boards. He took out his last copper and thrust it in. A little pink card came out with a printed stamp, a girl's head, long hair, the legend, true love. It was addressed to My Dear Pet, Spooner's Nook, 
with Cupid's love, and there was a picture of a young man in evening dress kneeling on the floor, kissing the hand of a girl carrying a big fur. Up in the corner, two hearts were transfixed by an arrow just above Reg number 745812. Cubit thought, It's clever. It's cheap for a penny. He looked quickly over his shoulder, not a soul, and turned it quickly and began to read. The letter was addressed from Cupid's wings, a moor lane. My dear little girl, so you have discarded me for the squire's son. You little know how you have ruined my life in breaking faith with me. You have crushed the very soul out of me as the butterfly on the wheel. But with it all, I do not wish anything but your happiness. Cubit grinned uneasily. He was deeply moved. That was what always happened if you took up with anything but a bure. They gave you the air, grand renunciations, tragedies. Beauty moved in Cubit's brain. If it was a bure, of course, you took a razor to her, carved her face, but this love printed here was class. He read on. It was literature. It was the way he'd like to write himself. After all, when I think of your wondrous, winsome beauty, and culture, I feel what a fool I must have been to dream that you ever really loved me. Unworthy. Emotion pricked behind his eyelids, and he shivered in the mist with cold and beauty. But remember, dearest, always that I love you. And if ever you want a friend, just return the little token of love I gave you, and I will be your servant and slave. Yours, brokenheartedly, John. It was his own name, an omen. He moved past again the lighted concert hall and down the deserted deck, loved and lost. Tragic griefs flamed under his carrot hair. What can a man do but drink? He got another whiskey just opposite the pier head and moved on, planting his feet rather too firmly towards the cosmopolitan. Plank, 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 along the pavement, as if he were wearing iron weights under his shoes, like a statue might move half flesh, half stone. I want to speak to Mr. Colioni, he said it defiantly. The plush and Gilding smoothed away his confidence. He waited uneasily beside the desk while a page boy searched through the lounges and boudoirs for Mr. Colioni. The clerk turned over the leaves of a big book and then consulted the who's who. Across the deep carpet, the page turned and Crab followed him, sidling and triumphant with his black hair smelling of pomade. I said, Mr. Colioni, Cubitt said to the clerk, but the clerk took no notice, wetting his finger, skimming through who's who. You wanted to see Mr. Colioni, Crab said. That's right. You can't. He's occupied. Occupied, Cubitt said. That's a fine word to use. Occupied. Why, if it isn't Cubitt, Crab said. I suppose you want a job. He looked round in a busy, preoccupied way and said to the clerk, Isn't that Lord Feversham over there? Yes, sir, the clerk said. I've often seen him at Doncaster, Crabbe said, squinting at a nail on his left hand. He swept round on Cubit. Follow me, my man. We can't talk here. And before Cubit could reply, he was sidling off at a great rate between the gilt chairs. It's like this, Cubit said, Pinky. Halfway across the lounge, Crab paused and bowed, and moving on became suddenly confidential. A fine woman. He flickered like an early movie. He had picked up between Doncaster and London a hundred different manners traveling first class, 
after a successful meeting, he had learnt how Lord Feversham spoke to a porter. He had seen old Digby scrutinize a woman. Who is she? Cubitt asked. But Crabbe took no notice of the question. We can talk here. It was the Pompadour Bordor. Through the gilt and glass door, beyond the buhl table, you could see little signboards pointing down a network of passages, tasteful little chinozeri signboards with the tuleries air, ladies, gentlemen, ladies' hairdressing, gentlemen's hairdressing. It's Mr. Colioni I want to talk to, Cubic said. He breathed whiskey over the marquetry, but he was daunted and despairing. He resisted with difficulty the temptation to say, Sir. Crab had moved on since Kite's day, almost out of sight. He was part of the great racket now with Lord Feversham and the fine woman. He had grown up. Mr. Colioni hasn't time to see everybody, Crab said. He's a busy man. He took one of Colioni's cigars out of his pocket and put it to his mouth. He didn't offer one to Cubit. Cubit, with uncertain hand, offered him a match. Never mind, never mind, Crab said, fumbling in his double-breasted waistcoat. He fetched out a gold lighter and flourished it at his cigar. What do you want, Cubit? he asked. I thought maybe, Cubit said, but his words wilted among the gilt chairs. You know how it is, he said, staring desperately around. What about a drink? Crag took him quickly up. I wouldn't mind one, just for old time's sake. He rang for a waiter. Old times, Cubit said. Take a seat, Crab said, waving a possessive hand at the gilt chairs. Cubit sat gingerly down. The chairs were small and hard. He saw a waiter watching them and flushed. What's yours? he asked. A sherry, Crab said. Dry. Scotch and splash for me, Cubit said. He sat waiting for his drink, his hands between his knees silent, his head lowered. He took furtive glances. This was where Panky had come to see Colioni. He had nerve all right. They do you pretty well here, Crab said. Of course, Mr. Mr. Colioni likes nothing but the best. He took his drink and watched Cubit pay. He likes things smart. Why, he's worth 50,000 knicker if he's worth a penny. If you ask me what I think, Crab said, leaning back, puffing at the cigar, watching Cubit through remote and supercilious eyes. He'll go in for politics one day. The conservatives think a lot of him. He's got contacts. Pinky, Cubit began, and Crab laughed. Take my advice, Crab, said. Get out of the mob while there's time. There's no future. He looked obliquely over Cubit's head and said, See that man going to the gents? That's Mays, the brewer. He's worth a hundred thousand necker. I was wondering, Cubit said, if Mr. Colioni... Not a chance, Crab said. Why ask yourself? What good would you be to Mr. Colioni? Cubit's humility gave way to a dull anger. I was good enough for Kite, Crab laughed. Excuse me, he said, but Kite... He shook his ash out onto the carpet and said, Take my advice. Get out. Mr. Colioni is going to clean up this track. He likes things done properly. No violence. The police have great confidence in Mr. Colioni. He looked at his watch. Well, well, I must be going. I've got a date at the Hippodrome. He put his hand with patronage on Cubit's arm. There, he said. I'll put in a word for you, for old time's sake. It won't be any good, but I'll do that much. Give my regards to Pinky and the boys. He passed, a whiff of pomade and Havana. 
bowing slightly to a woman at the door, an old man with a monocle on a black ribbon. Who the hell? the old man said. Cubitt drained his drink and followed. An enormous depression bowed his carrot head. A sense of ill treatment moved through the whiskey fumes. Somebody, sometime, had got to pay for something. All that he saw fed the flame. He came out into the entrance hall. A page boy with a solver infuriated him. Everybody was watching him, waiting for him to go, but he had as much right there as crap. He glanced round him, and there alone, at a little table with a glass of port, was the woman Crab knew. He watched her with covetous envy, and she smiled at him. I think of your wondrous, winsome beauty and culture. A sense of immeasurable sadness of injustice took the place of anger. He wanted to confide, to lay down burdens. He belched once. I will be your loving slave. The great body turned like a door. The heavy feet altered direction and padded towards the table where Ida Arnold sat. I couldn't help hearing, she said, when you went across just now, that you knew Pinky. He realized with immense pleasure when he spoke that she wasn't class. It seemed to him like the meeting of two fellow countrymen a long way from home. He said, You a friend of Pinky's? And felt the whiskey in his legs. He asked, Mind if I sit down? Tired. That's it, he said. Tired. He sat down with his eyes on her large, friendly bosom. He remembered the lines on his character. You have a free, easy, and genial nature. By God, he had. He only needed to be treated right. Have a drink? No, no, he said with woolly gallantry. It's on me. But when the drinks came, he realized he was out of cash. He had meant to borrow from one of the boys, but then the quarrel. He watched Ida, Arnold, pay with a five-pound note. No, Mr. Colioni, he asked. I wouldn't call it no, she said. Crab said you were a fine woman. He's right. Oh, Crab, she said vaguely, as if she didn't recognize the name. You ought to steer clear, though, Hubert said. You've no call to get mixed up in things. He stared into the glass, as into a deep darkness outside, Innocence, winsome beauty and culture, unworthy, a tear gathered behind the bloodshot eyeball. You a friend of Pinky's? Ida Arnold asked. Christ, no, Cubitt said, and took some more whiskey. A vague memory of the Bible where it lay in the cupboard next to the board, the Warwick deeping, the good companions stirred in Ida Arnold's memory. I've seen you with them, she lied. A courtyard, a sewing wench beside the fire, the cock crowing. I'm no friend of Pinky's. It's not safe being friends with Pinky, Ida Arnold said. Cubitt stared into his glass like a diviner into the, his soul, reading the dooms of strangers. Fred was a friend of Pinky's, she said. What do you know about Fred? People talk, Ida Arnold said. People talk all the time. You're right, Cupid said. The stained eyeballs lifted. They gazed at comfort, understanding. He wasn't good enough for Colioni. He had broken with Pinky. Behind her head, through the window of the lounge darkness and retreating sea. Christ, he said, you're right. He had an enormous urge to confession. But the facts were confused. He only knew that these were the times when a man needed a woman's understanding. I've never held with it, he told her. Carving's different. Of course carving's different, Ida Arnold smoothly and deftly agreed. And Kite, that was an accident. They only meant to carve him. Colioni is no fool. Somebody slipped. 
there wasn't any cause for bad feeling. Have another drink? It ought to be on me, Cupid said, but I'm cleaned out. Till I see the boys. It was fine of you, breaking with Pinky like that. It needed courage after what happened to Fred. Oh, he can't scare me. No broken banisters. What do you mean, broken banisters? I wanted to be friendly, Cupid said. A joke's a joke. When a man's getting married, he ought to take a joke. Married? Who married? Pinky, of course. Not to the little girl at Snow's. Of course. The little fool, Ida Arnold said with sharp anger. Oh, the little fool. He's not a fool, Cubit said. He knows what's good for him, if she chose to say a thing or two. You mean, say it wasn't Fred left the ticket? Poor old Spicer, Cubit said, watching the bubbles rise in the whiskey. A question floated up. How did you, but broke in the doped brain? I want air, he said. Stuffy in here. What say you and I? Just wait a while, Ida, Arnold said. I'm expecting a friend. I'd like you and him to be acquainted. This central heating, Cupid said, it's not healthy. You go out and catch a chill, and the next you know. When's the wedding? Whose wedding? Pinky's. I'm no friend of Pinky's. You didn't hold with Fred's death, did you? Idle Arnold softly persisted. You understand a man. Carving would have been different. Cubit suddenly, furiously broke out. I can't see a piece of Brighton Rock without... He belched and said with tears in his voice, Carving's different. The doctor said it was natural causes. He had a weak heart. Come outside, Cubit said. I got to get some air. Just wait a bit. What do you mean, Brighton Rock? He stared inertly back at her. He said, I got to get some air, even if it kills me. This central heating, he complained. I'm liable to colds. Just wait two minutes. She put her hand on his arm, feeling an intense excitement, the edge of discovery above the horizon, and was aware herself for the first time of the warm, close air welling up around them from hidden gratings, driving them into the open. She said, I'll come out with you. We'll take a walk. He watched her with a nodding head with an immense indifference. As if he had lost grip on his thought, as you lose a dog's lead, and it has disappeared, too far to be followed, in what would. He was astonished when she said, I'll give you twenty pounds. What had he said that was worth that money? She smiled enticingly at him. Just let me put on a bit of powder and have a wash. He didn't respond. He was scared, but she couldn't wait for a reply. She dived for the stairs. No time for the lift. A wash. They were the words she had used to Fred. She ran upstairs. People were coming down, changed to dinner. She hammered on her door and Phil Corkery let her in. Quick, she said, I want a witness. He was dressed, thank goodness, and she raced him down, but immediately she got into the hall. She saw that Cubit had gone. She ran out onto the steps of the Cosmopolitan, but he wasn't in sight. Well, Mr. Corkery said. Gone, never mind, Ida Arnold said. I know now, all right. It wasn't suicide. They murdered him, she said slowly over to herself. Brighton Rock, the clue would have seemed hopeless to many women, but Ida Arnold had been trained by the board. Queerer things than that had spidered out under her fingers. And old crows with complete confidence, her mind began to work. 
The night air stirred Mr. Corkery's thin yellow hair. It may have occurred to him that on an evening like this, after the actions of love, romance was required by any woman. He touched her elbow timidly. What a night, he said. I never dreamed what a night, but words drained out as she switched towards him her large, thoughtful eyes. Uncomprehending, full of other ideas. She said slowly, The little fool, to marry him. Why, there's no knowing what he'll do. A kind of righteous mirth moved her to add with excitement. We gotta save her, Phil. 